Hi everyone, bonjour tout le monde. Je suis très heureux d'animer le, le... I'm very happy to panel this panel, <laughs> to be in charge of this panel. Left with Ravi. Hi, uh, Ravi Loganasan. I head up our financial institution business line at Sardine. Uh, Sardine is a fraud risk compliance risk management platform. We help financial institutions protect themselves, uh, particularly in the phase where you're going into real time payments and instant settlement. You need a fundamental shift in the fraud paradigm and how you detect fraud. And we help financial institutions, fit fintechs and crypto companies uh, defend themselves uh, against fraud. Prior to Sardine, um, I was on the founding team of Zelle Network, uh, where I was the chief data officer. And then before that, at Bank of America in various roles. So traditional finance background. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm Jane Barrett. I'm the chief advocacy officer at MX. Uh, MX provides data and software services for banks, fintechs, and um, the channel partners of the world. Um, we, I have been driving our open banking and open finance initiatives for the last four years. So doing all of the negotiating with large institutions, working on contracts, working on implementation with the team, but also focusing on the policy and regulatory side of things. So having a foot in both camps has been very helpful. Um, prior to MX, I was a fintech founder and MX was actually my data partner. It's a small world. Bonjour à tous, uh, Yves Gabriel Leboeuf, co-founder and CEO of Flinx. Flinx is Hello a everyone. So we ultimately build uh, the infrastructure for financial institutions to be able to uh, enable open banking, but also for a financial technology company and consumers to access their financial data. We're a Montreal-based company founded six years ago, um, and uh, we uh, we have National Bank of Canada as one of the major shareholders of the company. Uh, prior to Flinks is probably irrelevant for uh, this forum. So uh, that's pretty much it, Julie. <laughs> Thank you, YG. Hi, my name is Julie Levac. I'm the head of technology and the banking operations for National Bank, uh, working very closely with uh, Philip and Annie Ventures, as well as our colleagues on the panel. Glad to see you. And, and you know, when I started Any Ventures a few years back, uh, Flinks was one of my first investment. And I remember when I got and talked to the bank about Flinks, one of the first questions I was asked about is the question I'm going to ask you first. What is open banking? <laughs> and maybe starting with you, YG, and then we'll go down the panel. Sure. I mean, it's still a hard question to answer. Uh, I think the concept of, of open banking is uh, making sure consumers and businesses have an easy access to their financial data. Um, the way we now see open banking is as an as kind of a block toward what we call open finance. Uh, so open banking can be super precise to um, transaction banking, but it, it can also embed uh, payment, um, insurance data, credit data, and so on. Uh, but as first and form, foremost, the way we see open banking for now uh, um, or for the current needs from a, by example, regulation standpoint is from a transaction, uh, um, banking transaction standpoint. Yeah, I think I can augment that a little from a MX perspective. We, we really look at open banking as the way to access, but also be able to share like in a permissioned way where your data wants to go, but then take it to the next step, understand and act as well, because just being able to share raw data is, uh, you know, it doesn't help that much. So making sure that at the core of when someone is permissioning access to that data and permissioning is key, that it is secure um, and there's an outcome to it as well. Another way to kind of also add to that is when you think about open banking, uh, the way I think about it is it's actually the framework by which you allow third parties to come in and build applications and services around a financial institution. Um, so that framework, the key underpinning of that framework, of course, is consumer permission data. So that is allowing the consumer to provide access to their data such that those experiences can be personalized. Um, and relevant, right? And you've seen different applications of that across the globe. Uh, but the key here is the underpinning is the framework for third party applications. And then the underpinning of all of that is permission data. 
I don't think I have anything to add mm -hmm. other than the, um, from a bank point of view, uh, in addition to what my colleagues have said, it's really to enhance the customer experience at the end of the day. So this drives all the, you know, the, you know, the, the thinking around the open banking and why it's so important to uh, focus and put effort making sure that this happens in Canada. And when we think about open banking, it's been going on for a while in the UK, in the US, a bit less in the UK, in Australia as well. We can, as a country that is a bit later to the, uh, to the fight, we can learn from the other. What did work and what did not work and what was the advantage and the inconvenience for open banking in the UK and in other jurisdictions? Maybe starting with uh, you, Jane. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, for if you couldn't tell, I am actually Australian, but I'm based in the US. But my husband's Canadian, so I feel like I've got all <laughs> of the things here. Um, so the UK, there was a joke about three years ago that people in the UK thought that open banking just meant that branches were open longer. Ha ha, right? That was like this very, no one understand, no one really cares. When it was initially set up, it sort of intersected both PSD2 in Europe from a payment perspective and then Open Banking UK. So there was sort of two um, core forces going on there, but it really focused very tightly on current accounts, so checking accounts, so very narrow retail. Um, but with the intersection of PSD2, there was a lot more focus on payments than there has been certainly in the US or Canada. So fast forward to I was in the UK this summer and um, I was at a hair salon and an older woman there told me when I went to pay, she said, oh, no, you can only pay by bank or by cash. And I was like, well, I, I can't really do either. And she goes, give me your phone. It's very easy. And so she went to, I was like, I don't have a UK bank account. And then we were both really confused. But to see that leapfrog from cards as completely, you know, the dominant form of payment to some smaller, because obviously getting out of merchant fees, some smaller retailers saying, no, we won't even accept cards anymore. We'll just pay by bank. So I, that was probably an unintended consequence, but it was um, a very fast movement. I think from a having that regulatory first approach meant that, you know, innovation happened in this more narrow channel. So there's still a lot of catching up to do in wealth, in commercial treasury. Like there's a lot of other areas of um, just banking generally that did not get included in that first. And I think that was one of the biggest learnings is that, yeah, you can see a lot of advancement, but what happens outside that is so. Uh, and it's very interesting when you're talking about wealth and other not being included. Do you see them being included in the near future or we're not there yet? I'm going to take them. I mean, I'm, I, I think it has to be. It has to be. Right. Um, so when you think about um, both on the bank transaction side, uh, both on the deposit business, the payments business, it has to actually move into the wealth management because ultimately, from a consumer experience standpoint, you need, you need that holistic view of the end consumer and such that those services that are ultimately being built uh, through third party applications also have to start taking a holistic view. So um, as you as open banking progresses, particularly on the retail consumer banking side, it certainly has to progress from the consumer deposit business to wealth management such that you can provide that comprehensive experience to the end consumer. You know, going back to um, the UK and certainly Europe, um, you know, I think to your earlier question, there are some important rails that have been uh, set uh, to the point made earlier, which is certainly it's a regulator led model, but it's some important foundational pieces have been set, particularly around sharing payments information. There is a utility that now serves that purpose. Uh, there is also a utility that per serves that purpose in terms of uh, sharing identity information. So the data layer is definitely a level playing field to kind of build on, to kind of expand it beyond to the question that was raised, uh, beyond retail banking into wealth management and so forth. And then you contrast that to the states. Um, you know, it's been fintech led. Uh, rapid acceleration of consumer-based applications, which has now led to uh, you to aggregators in the in this in the space. The question now is, what is going to be those set of utilities that are going to be uh, generally available? Um, because there is still a need for standardization of data. 
Um, and what you see in the states is emergence of consortiums, right? So there is bank-led consortiums such as TCH or early warning services where data is being limitedly shared uh, within those banking-led consortiums. You have other fintech-led initiatives that is beginning to share data. But in the states, you're missing that regulator-led effort to stand up some core utilities that is beginning to standardize that data that you see uh, in Europe and UK. So there's some interesting lessons to be learned from that for Canada um, as you guys pursue um, this open banking framework. I know there's a lot of discussions in that regard. And I, and I would add to what you just said as well, when we look into what has been implemented either uh, UK, Australia, or Brazil for that matter, uh, what we need to make sure is that we learn from what they've implemented, what applies to Canada. As you all know in the room and, and online, in Canada we have a very specific and different type of environment. We have our own, you know, different types of payment rails, um, uh, different ecosystems. So what we need to make sure going forward is that we have an open banking framework, policy, what's the role of the different organization, either Bank of Canada, the government, um, as well as private and public um, say into how we operate this. So I think to your question, uh, what has been done in UK is a good lesson learned. What are the things that we should do, not sh should do? Look at Australia as well and look into closer in Brazil that looks like a model that is probably a little bit closer to what Canada is leading to. Um, we'll see, we'll hear in a couple of months uh, once the, uh, the result of the uh, consultation with the government is completed. I, if I may, um, when all panelists agree with the same thing, generally it's a boring panel, but I agree with my colleagues here. <laughs> um, um, I think one of the uh, teasers we're building internally at Flings is that we're not in favor of doing exactly what they did in Europe and UK. We're not in favor in doing what is being done in the US or um, trying to build a thesis around some kind of hybrid model, uh, which we think will have a component of market-driven solution, but also government-led solution. Um, that's, that's what we, we foresee. And maybe we, before we would move full-fledged to Canada, one last question on international. So during Money 2020, CPFB came out, made an announcement. And Jane, maybe I'll turn to you if you could explain what CPFB announced mm -hmm. and what it means for the U.S. market uh, before we, we move to mm -hmm. Canada. So the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau has authority under uh, Dodd-Frank 1033 to oversee data. Um, that one clause has been debated for the last 12, 13 years around what does it actually mean that banks have to enable access to their data? Does it mean print it out and hand it over? Like it's been very, very uh, broad. So the process has been underway to really to promulgate a rule, an actual rule that will be in place to say these, this is the framework for how data should be shared. Um, it has been a very long process. It was two years ago where there was a lot of submissions from the industry put forward. And at Money 2020, the current director of the CFPB stood up and gave a very uh, impassioned speech that started off, and I'll sound parochial as an Australian, and one of the biggest surprises was he referred to a consumer data right. right? It wasn't access, it was a consumer data right. And that's a very deliberate statement around Will there be legal rights for people to own their data, legal rights to access? Again, there wasn't pure clarity, but it was the first time the CFPB had been that broad around a data right. Um, he definitely put some warning shots in place. So the current stage of the process is sort of the last getting information. And they've gone out to the, the industry, especially small businesses. How can this impact you? Um, with the view to having a role drafted next year and then implemented the year after. So government moves slow on purpose. <laughs> and I think this is an example of, you know, making sure that innovation is protected. And the US is different, I think, to many Commonwealth countries in terms of regulation is often last resort. It's not something that is, yeah. Um, so it's generally not that proactive, but where the biggest insight was, was around competition. And the, the, the idea that 
in the past data was a strategic advantage. We keep it within our walls, we protect our customers, we cross sell, we don't let them share. Um, the director had, was very specific and he came from the um, FTC, which is all about competition, was that we need to enable competition through data sharing. And that was heard very, very loud and clear. Um, there were a few surprises in there. We were expecting a more, we will regulate intermediaries like MX and Flinx. Um, we didn't hear that, still may come, um, but there is at least a path to seeing a rule in place within the next 18 months. Um, and there are many institutions like BNC that have worked ahead Right, of and making sure that you know APIs and infrastructure are in place. So the impact may more so be on the longer tail. So on the regionals and local banks, credit unions, those who haven't invested in the infrastructure yet. But it was a very deliberate, deliberately worded speech, and it was a little bit of a saber rattling as well. It, it was very formal as well. So they mm -hmm. had to change the entire setup and they put that little <laughs> A mm -hmm. thing from which he could speak to with a protection in very front of him. Was, uh, <laughs> yes, very presidential. It was very <laughs> funny. Uh, uh, so now that, that we've spoke about what's happening outside in NYG, uh, Julie, you started aiming onto it. We can do it differently in Canada. So uh, Julie, you were talking about Brazil. How is the Brazilian system maybe closer to what we want to do? And what's the benefit of doing it that way? I think the way that they've looked at it, um, dividing you know between policy, governance, and execution, I think is something that um, they've imp they've they've implemented. It is something that we uh, should should look into um, definitely, and we are, I think, in the in the, in the working groups that are and the workshops that are happening with the government, as well as the different work stream. This is something that is differently uh, looked into, and I, I alluded it to it before. We we have a different ecosystem in Canada. Uh, we need to uh, put together a framework, a policy, and an operating model that fits our purpose. So I think that's the that's the key, um, keeping focus on it. So the dates are quite ambitious. Uh, it requires that everybody rallies around it um, and and keep working towards those those dates. Um, it is not an easy uh, an easy task, it, it, and you've alluded to in the beginning as well. Some of the colleagues, Canada is a little lagging, uh, not just a little, in some in some instances. So we're keeping up. We need to catch up so that we are back into back into the race with with everyone. It's such an enabler, such a value creating from a consumer point of view and an end user point of view that um, we need to act on it. And, uh, you know, even if the, the, today the framework is not present, screen scraping is happening, uh, you know, so th these activities um, are still part of day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, what runs some of our businesses. So we need to really act on it and make sure that we have a framework, we have a policy that is embedded and operationalized. And it will, you know, it will benefit everyone, the fintechs, the government, to some extent, but definitely everyone and the consumer. At the end of the day, it's the consumer that's going to benefit, benefit the most out of it. Any, anything to add, guys, to this? Yeah. Um, Do you <clears throat> want to argue with me? <laughs> <laughs> well, on that. <laughs> um, no, I think we're extremely excited about the future uh, from an open banking standpoint here in Canada. Uh, of course, Phoenix is quite excited. Uh, to be the, the, the first um, technology company powering open banking APIs in Canada with National Bank, but uh, with EQ Bank as well. Other coming up, I wish I can make announcement today. I can for now. Um, I will look at my phone. But uh, <laughs> um, so there is more coming up, and this is entirely market driven which to me is eye-opening. This means financial institutions are understanding the value of investing in providing API for financial technology company to access the data and other bank, of course. Um, so to me, the momentum is increasing. We're extremely excited, but also um, I think the model has to be a Canadian one. What we're seeing now versus five years ago is that we're kind of moving toward that and what i see about the canadian model is um um 
hey, I'm sorry, handshake, and let's work together kind of thing. So uh, I think we're able now to sit with larger financial institutions, smaller association of credit unions, and find solutions together. They have concerns, we have concerns, consumers group have concerns. How can we make that work together so systemically it's better for everyone? That's the goal. And that's how the Canadian model will be different, or that's how I expect it to be different. That's also why we can look at what's happening uh, in other jurisdictions, but we can't really copy what they're doing. Um, so that's that's what I'm, I'm you're, seeing. You're right, it is exciting time. Yeah. It's exciting it's, time. It's really yeah. exciting time. More times. than ever. I know like yes. open banking is probably not that exciting as a <laughs> subject, uh, but within open banking, we're super excited. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, Ravi, anything to add? Um, you know, one, one area that um, quite a bit of lessons learned is that common standard for data access, right? So as Canada begins to solve that, um, you know, with uh, the folks on the table already moving down that path is going to be the, is really going to be the, 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 the most important element into this. And uh, there are different ways to solve that problem. Um, uh, particularly when we, when you go down the path of looking at that data sharing component, What's going to also become important is how do you also share risk and fraud data? Yeah. Um, so it's no longer about getting access to that consumer data and you're now making it available to third parties who can then build new experiences. And what you're seeing certainly in the States and what you're also seeing in Europe is you now have proliferation of different payment rails different uh, ways of accessing funds. And what you're now seeing is kind of the disintermediation of information related to fraud and risk. So as more options are now made available through open banking, there has to be a question to ask, how are you going to also solve the fraud and risk problems? Because you now have multiple ways of paying someone, multiple ways of accessing various services. And the fraudsters are well aware of that. They are you know, attacking one, one rail, coming back and attacking another, because they know that those rails are not sharing information on if an account has been uh, hit with fraud. So as Canada begins to look at this model, I think there are some important lessons learned in that regard, which is how will you manage fraud and risk in an open banking framework? Um, and there are some very important lessons to be learned in that regard. Yeah, I think there's also some competitive aspects here in that sometimes open banking is seen as, you know, check a box, or we've done it now, we've stood up our APIs, but there are a lot of lessons learned around, okay, you've stood up APIs, customers are sharing, now their expectations are up here. I mean, it doesn't matter where they've been sharing, it might have been a credit card or retail bank or wealth, but I can do this on one place, but, you know, it's like a high speed Wi-Fi experience. And then I go back to my credit union and it's like dial up. And so how long will customers be okay with having these two different um, elements? So that's one piece of the competitive. It is an absolute competitive advantage from a customer perspective, but it's also a competitive advantage from a revenue perspective because that same suite of APIs can then be deployed into embedded finance, banking as a service, like there's many other things that we'll keep on innovating on top of. Thank you. And, and I think for, for the next question, I want to see you dance on eggs a bit. So <laughs> um, here's my question. Why do you think in Canada, big banks have been more reluctant to adopt open banking? And we see that smaller banks are leading the charge into open banking. So why did you already mention national and EQ, but we, we, we see those smaller banks being way more interested. So I, I'm letting one of you jump into that, that, that basket of crabs. Anyone? <laughs> I'm jumping to the basket of crabs. <laughs> um, I can take a stab. Uh, yeah. Oh no, you go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I mean often <laughs> it's hard to know what's going on behind the walls versus what's being yeah. said publicly, but I think going back to the competitive, we can't assume that anyone's sitting on their hands. Um, I can say from a US perspective, it was the biggest banks who have been investing for five plus years now. And so they've checked the boxes and moved on into new business cases. Um, I think 
traditionally, again, Canada, like Australia, UK, has been more regulatory led. There's more centralized regulation. I think there was an expectation of rules and standards coming out from a central authority. But uh, honestly, I think it comes down to the business case. Right? When you can say, you know, every time a screen scraper hits our service, it costs us five cents, let's say. Or, um, you know, we're seeing higher rates of retention and cross-sell with customers who can securely share their data, right? So the fear of if we enable data access, they're going to leave it has just not proven to be true. So I think until there's really mass understanding of that, but to your the second part of your question, it's hard for big, big ships to turn. So I think there's uh, there's something a big advantage to be more nimble. Yeah, and I'll add to that, I think it's a massive cultural shift, right? You know, historically financial institutions wanted to own the entire customer. Uh, that every touch point had to be owned by that FI or that institution. Um, so those institutions that realize that they're not going to be able to build every single unique experience for their customer, uh, that they need to start to build an ecosystem of providers that they can partner with and give access to. And the end goal is to provide an enriched experience. Some of those experience could be homegrown and built within the bank but others are actually provided through your partner network and your broader ecosystem. So that approach and culture shift and kind of the general approach to the marketplace, uh, obviously institutions are in different phases of that transition. And that also kind of reflects in the strategy as well. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll stop at that. <laughs> Why do you want to have a stab at it? You, you wanted yes. to jump in first. So. <laughs> I mean, might surprise you with my answer, but to their defense, I think it's extremely hard um, to build something without having a strong case around it. Uh, and we're such in a unique market that being the first at doing something might be a hard business case to build, to your point. Second, um, I think most of the large bank um, uh, have other priorities. I think most of them are built on like 90, 1960s technology that um, they're, they don't even understand. Um, and that's probably way more expensive on a daily basis than thinking of doing open banking. Um, so that's a massive problem for financial institutions. Um, and it was five years ago. And I think we're getting into something else, a new phase right now. Um, on the flip side, I think, we have to understand that for them to open up something probably means more competition. Um, I think now that we're seeing more and more model across the world where um, it, it's more competition for everyone, meaning banks can win out of it as well. Uh, I think it makes it an interesting case for them uh, now to launch something. Yeah. I, and I would add to, to what everyone said. I also think that it was a concept. It was, you know, nice in theory. Um, now we've seen traction. The government has really like um, put a, put out consultation, put a paper last year, nominated someone. Traction is now there. Um, I think that also um, accelerates some of the thinking. And it's not um, that necessarily they're more reluctant, but there's many things to tackle at the same time. Uh, many many threats that are going on. Now that we see there's a date, it's progressing. I think that we'll see a lot more and we could say in some of the workshops and um, you know the work streams that are happening everybody's very involved uh, all the banks the credit unions as well as the fintechs so everybody's around the table and and putting together a framework and and a, and a plan for for canada so i think the traction was in there the, you know not, not all the stars were aligned now we're getting there and and i think speaking for us um, we see a huge opportunity. Um, it is, you know, it is part of our technology uh, plan for National Bank, but uh, it is also a great enabler. So that's why we've been, you know, forefront into into that with with Flinks and and and, and MX as well. So, and and, and maybe a last question before we move to to a question from uh, the room. Talking a lot about open banking today. And what I'm wondering is banks are not historically the best one at being first at something. 
and now we've been asked to be first in open banking. Why are we not talking about open data and really sharing the entirety and putting the data in the end of the customers rather than only asking for the banks to do it? Hmm. Great question. <laughs> I might say, Why, Phil, tell us. <laughs> uh, hey, I'm the moderator. <laughs> well, no, was, well, go ahead. I think like the way I personally see it is that um, banking was ready for disruption and that's why we saw a wave of fintech over the past um, economical cycle and the past couple of years. Um, I think open banking is one block toward having a world of open finance, like open banking, open finance, open data. Um, I hope eventually we'll be in a world of open data where it's easy to access everything. Because right now, yes, it's important to access open uh, banking information through open banking, but being in Quebec, it's probably harder to access your medical file. Um, and to me, that's a problem as well. Um, so I hope from my living that we'll live in an open data world, uh, but I think it's great that we're starting with banking. Yeah. And, you're, and you're right, and you, when you think about it, the open banking at this moment in time is under the, the read, not write, but obviously it's going to come to that and then evolves to some to much bigger than what it is now. So I think it's a first step in the entire ecosystem. The, the, the key is going to be um, how fast we are progressing towards that. Yeah, and I think, uh, I know we've referenced Australia a few times where they were the Australian people were assigned their legal right to access their data. Financial services was first, but it was followed very quickly by energy, telecommunications. I think healthcare is being pushed a little further out, but um, the thesis is the more that people can see like their consumption habits, the competitive offers and enable portability between them, the stronger the competition is. So. It will be somewhat led by innovation as well. Um, financial services have been, or institutions have been getting scraped for a very long time to enable um, different fintech use cases. Is that same thing true in energy, healthcare, telco, and others? But uh, the open the open data world, we have to assume in our lifetime, will be a very normal thing. We're seeing some use cases now of like life management tools where you do, you put in your calendar, you put in your healthcare, you put in your uh, financial services information. And if that part could hurry up, would be really great. <laughs> <laughs> Ravi, any, any comment on this? Yeah, I mean, I think I would, and I would add to that by saying, if you put a individual or the consumer in the forefront, it's all about their rights to the data. And I think from there, you kind of solve that problem, right? So you not only is it banking data, is, is it not only your healthcare data, not only is your telco data. Uh, if you put the consumer in the middle, it is all about the consumer rights to their own data. Uh, and that fundamental shift is taking place. I know we are now talking about open banking, but there's also this whole notion of decentralized finance that is already out there that is beginning to kind of liberate um, the access to data and the ownership of data back to the individual. Uh, so I think it's, it's uh, very much open data. And I think we'll answer the question, not just in financial services, but other sectors by asking the question, who owns that data and the rights of that data? And then the rest of the model will fall. And, and James, I want to reassure you, as you said earlier, the conferences are very, very fast. So we should have uh, healthcare included in yeah. that in Canada soon because it's, it's, it's part of the government. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll open the floor for a question to our panel. Hi everyone, uh, great conversation. I, I think what sometimes is, uh, sometimes is overlooked in the UK and what was the accelerant to open data was that they part nationalized the two largest banks in the UK, which meant the government had a huge influence on the direction of open banking. Um, so I'd love to hear from you. Are there catalysts to accelerate that advancement here in Canada? So I actually think we're not behind the UK. I just think there were there were specific things about the UK market that meant that it moved first and quickest. 
anyone wants to jump in. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, let me say this. I think government has a role here on the infrastructure. So the, I think the key question I believe is being debated here in Canada is exactly that, right? Who Who is going to provide that core data infrastructure? Is that going to be led by the private sector? Is it going to be led by a handful of banks? Or is it is it the government that is going to set up? It's basically a data utility, right? So that's where competitive that's, utility. Yeah, competitive. it's a competitive utility. <laughs> well, I mean, we just talked about consumers' rights and ownership of data, right? Uh, so if the consumer at the end of the day owns that data, who is responsible for setting up that infrastructure so that data is cared for, right? So I think, uh, yeah. So I think uh, the UK with PSD2 and so forth, um, took the first step and it was a government led effort. And the key was normalizing that infrastructure, that data infrastructure, such that the private sector can build on it. Uh, so I think it's a very interesting question for Canada in terms of um, how you want to take that path. I would add to that that, and we said it before, it's very, you know, very different in Canada. If you think about it, you're, you have the open banking initiative, you have the RTR initiatives, you have the CDBC. All of these are all intertwined at some point, and we need to have a view on all three and others uh, to have a path going forward. And that's something that is currently being discussed as well, because when you look at the RTR project that is going to be delivered now, um, a couple of months from now, I don't remember the date exactly, but but that and open banking um, is going to overlap and join at some point. So we need to have that view and that discussion. So when we make decisions, we understand the ramification of all of this. This is very specific to Canada. So that's why we cannot just only rely on what happened in UK and Australia, but we need to have our own, to go back to your point, our own um, hybrid, model. hybrid model that is led by government and private sector yeah. at the same time. It was super interesting, thank you. Um, wondering what you all think the role or the impact of artificial intelligence, if any, there is on this new world of open banking and open data and how that's going to impact decisions that are made. Yeah, um, fa fascinating question because, you know, we, at Sardine, um, all of the, the fraud detection we do today, because money movement and settlement is now getting real time and instant, you no longer can rely on human driven models, right? So you do need AI, you do need machine learning algorithms uh, to detect those anomalies in a rapid fashion. Now, those algorithms are being I'm going to say put in good use uh, because we are trying to catch bad guys. Uh, but without a proper framework, you can begin to see the utilization of AI in very different ways. And that's a whole other panel. Uh, but yes, I think it's an important question because ultimately when you do have that data layer that we are talking about is a government private combined. Once you have that data layer in place, uh, you now have the ability to put artificial intelligence on top of that, all the way from the fraud detection components to recommending products and services, uh, and there are multiple applications on top of that, right? So again, um, again, a ton of work is going on in the private sector. Um, I think in Europe, there is a lot more sensitivity towards these machine learning based algorithms and how do we use it? When do we use it? I think those conversations are beginning to take place in North America, but yes, that's a, another interesting application. It's already happening on the, on the social platforms, right? Most of those are AI-based algorithms that are running behind the scenes. So yes, that's another, uh, another panel and another critical topic, yes. <laughs> another question from the public? Thank you so much. It is a really exciting time from an open banking perspective in Canada and for the fintechs. Um, but as we look to Australia from a consumer data right, New Zealand, now the US announcing this at Money 2020, um, the UK being re regulated to move forward, Brazil running forth so quickly with regulation to get from open banking to open finance. And, and really the story is, open finance is is the piece that's driving forth in so many countries to drive user 
uh, benefits for consumers and SMEs, I'm very excited we're getting to a read only in a first step perspective by next fall, thanks to Abraham and the government work. But how do we get in Canada to the next stage of when right access is going to be accessible, when we're going to move to potentially a consumer data right to get past what you guys are talking about um, to open finance, open energy, open telco, and, and beyond? I mean, great question. Uh, I, I kind of consider myself as a um, full-time uh, advocate for open data so that's uh, <laughs> i couldn't agree more with you um i think it's i think we'll have challenges it's my assumption but i think we'll have challenges moving from one to the other um if there's no disruption demand or uh strong consumer case around it um being in the the, the aggregation world right now i don't currently, by example, see any strong demand for uh, telco data in Canada. Um, perhaps there would be if we had a product, but um, there's still like not a strong case to be built here. So we may see a more top-down approach from a regulation standpoint in the future where we open up the right to access the data from a consumer standpoint, and then innovation is brought within Canada. Ideally, that's what we would see. Uh, but I, I think it's going to be extremely hard to see those cases uh, in the near future. I think <clears throat> just open banking is such uh, a big deal. Um, bringing RTR, I know we don't really put it into an open banking. But sometimes we do, really sometimes we don't. I think it's a big deal as well. Uh, and just that in itself is probably like 70% of what we need from an open data standpoint. Read, write access. Um, in, in Canada, that's, that's my assessment. I think from a, a hopeful perspective, <laughs> the amount of learning and lift that gets done in open banking, it's not going to be the same when you move into payroll data or wealth or small business, that there will be you know, easier steps as we go forward. I think I would hope that for Canada, we can do this like offensively and proactively versus defensively. Like we've seen in some markets, Australia is an example where because things like payroll and wealth weren't included, whole businesses stood up to scrape those. Yeah. So it was like this, again, unintended consequence of like we're trying to stop scraping in retail banking and then it's like, oh, but we're going to scrape for as long as we can in wealth and small business. So these are going to be uh, interesting, again, hopefully proactive versus there's a massive breach in the wealth space and now we have to accelerate. Let's say that that doesn't happen. And it's very, uh, uh, when you talk about open banking today, it's really only retail that is being affected mm -hmm. anywhere. Like no one has already has started touching commercial wealth and that's going to be two new areas completely to go and touch and probably will be touched before um, we get to open data and other industries. We only have a few seconds left, so I wanted to take the time to thank uh, all of my panelists for, for uh, being here with me today. Um, Ravi and Security, if you've got any needs on open banking, Securities, MX and Flinks as enablers, and then National Bank, not because I work there, but because it's the best bank in Canada. <laughs> so, I'm the best boss. <laughs> and she's definitely the best boss. Thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in for this uh, panel.